الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The second month of the fourth year of Hijrah the month of Safar was a very tragic month for the Muslims Ten of the finest companions of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام were betrayed by the envoy who pretended to be Muslims and requested their presence so that they could teach their people about Islam. In the middle of the way, they found that this was only an ambush for them. Ten of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ fought till their death. And the eighth soon followed and two were taken as prisoners of war. Khubayb ibn Adi, may Allah be pleased with him, was given to the family of Al-Harith ibn Amr, who he himself killed him on the Battle of Badr. So his family wanted to avenge their father. He was held captive for a few days until they decided to execute him and just before his execution we were told that a lady of the house where he was kept captive said that I've never seen a prisoner as noble as Khubayb may Allah be pleased with him she said that he requested for a blade so that he could shave the areas that we're told to shave. And without her noticing, one of her children ran to him. And he had the child with him playing, and he was sitting next to him with the blade in his hand. And she was terrified. She thought that he would do the normal thing for any prisoner who was just about to be executed. And he saw that petrified look in her face and he told her are you afraid that I might harm him don't be and he set the child back to his mother she said that he was not like any other prisoner he used to she says he used to eat grapes when there was not a single grape in the whole of Mecca and this was a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal and when it was time for his execution, he requested that he prays two rak'ahs. And they gave him that last wish. And he prayed two rak'ahs. And after he concluded them, he said that, had I not fear that you would think that I would prolong it because of fearing death, I would have. And they executed him. The other companion... I heard that uh, how they executed him were barbaric way and they were you know cutting off his skin and his muscles piece by piece is corrected the, the I, I do not recall any of this incident but he said something he said poetry that describes that even if they take piece and bits and pieces of my body this would not be enough because this death of mine is in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal. so and who knows maybe Allah will bless these scattered pieces of flesh and, and, and skin. But we were told that he was executed and he was crucified on a pole. And then one of the companions, and, and, and his name is Amr ibn Umayyah al-Dumari, came and at night time and took him and buried him without them noticing. The other companion was Zayd ibn al 
And as we said before, he was bought by Safwan ibn Umayyah. And in his execution day, just as they were about to behead him, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb stood up and said, O Zayd, do you wish that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your prophet, is now in your shoes, in your place, about to be executed, and that you are among your family and loved ones? It's a normal question. A man is about to die. Zayd ibn Dithinna said, By Allah, I swear that I would not love that the Prophet ﷺ would be hit by a thorn in his hand or in his leg and I am with my family. I'd rather die and not even this little pain would come to my Prophet ﷺ. Abu Sufyan said, I've never seen anyone love anyone like the companions love their Prophet ﷺ. And just before he was executed, he supplicated to Allah. And he, he, they executed him in the Haram area, close to the Kaaba. And he said, Oh Allah, destroy them all and do not abandon any one of them alive and kill them all. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, the son of Abu Sufyan, said that the minute he started supplicating, my father threw me on my side, on the floor. And it was the practice of the people of Quraysh, whenever anyone supplicated against you, if you lay down on your side on the floor, then you would escape this. This is what they thought. And this would not do any help. Among them was one of the companions by the name of Sayyid ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him. Sayyid ibn Amr was a ruler years later of Umar ibn Khattab and the village or the city he was the ruler of complained to Umar that this man while sitting and judging among the people faints every now and then he faints so he called him back he came to Medina and told him what is the cause of your fainting what's wrong with you why do you faint every now and then he said, O oh, Caliph of the believers, O oh, Umar, I was among those attending the execution of Zayd ibn Dathinna long ago. And whenever I recalled the, supplic the, the supplication he made, I faint. He's a Muslim. He's a companion. But just because he was present at that time. Doesn't uh, the action of... Uh Abu Muawiyah, uh, Abu Sufyan, uh, in that you know incident, when he threw his son on the floor, in order for him, as he think that it could avoid the supplication of that great companion, does the, this action, that action, does it give us hint that they believed in the prophet and in his message, but they were do, trying to deny it because he knew that the supplication would make something? Well, as I said, this was a traditional, an, an Arab tradition. Even before Islam, whoever supplicated, they were afraid that it would be answered, especially if he was unjustly treated. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with their belief or disbelief of the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yet they did believe that he was the messenger of Allah, but it was arrogance and denial. But on that particular occasion, they did what they did, or Abu Sufyan did what he did, because it was the Arab tradition to dodge and, and, and escape this supplication so that it would not uh, uh, hit his son. On the same month, the same tragic month of Safar of the fourth year of Al Hijrah, the Prophet, وسلم, while he was in Medina, he was approached by one of the tribal leaders of. Najd of the center of Arabia and his name was Amr ibn Malik the Prophet started وسلم, introducing Islam to him 
the man listened. He did not accept, but at the same time he did not reject. So the man invited the Prophet ﷺ to send an envoy of his companions to come and tour the villages and tribes of Najd and call them to Islam. Again, there were suspicion. So the Prophet told his guest of his fears and he told him that we have lots of bad experience with the tribes of Najd and the tribes surrounding Medina. And Amr ibn Malik, and he was known as Abu al-Bara, he told him that they will come in my custody and under my protection. I'm a leader of the tribes there, so no one would do any harm to them. The Prophet ﷺ trusted his word and he had a mission. He wanted to call the people to Islam. So he sent 70 of his finest companions. They were known to be Al-Qurra. And Al-Qurra mean, means the reciters of the Quran. So these 70 were all excellent companions of knowledge level uh, 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 to the extent that they've recited the Quran and they knew it by heart. So they were among the elite. We, they were described in the books of Sirah, to work at daytime and feed the people, the poor people, at nighttime with what they've made in the morning. And they used to pray all night long as in, 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 in night prayer to Allah the Almighty. So the Prophet ﷺ sent them. And they went and they started touring the villages and the tribes of Najd and they were armed but at the same time they had the security of Abu al-Bara Amr ibn Malik he was the leader of his tribe so in a sense they felt safe because they had the permission to tour without being uh, uh, faced with any harm or danger as long as they have this great leader protecting them and his word was sufficient and enough in these tribes. I believe we have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we will be back. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. The 70 companions of the Prophet ﷺ were touring the villages and the tribes of Najd, calling people to Islam. They went to a location known as Bi'r Ma'una or the well of Ma'una. And they sent one of their men to introduce Islam to him. And he was the leader of his tribe, Amr ibn Tufayl. But he was a wicked man. He was a very bad man. So they sent to him a man, a companion, by the name of Haram ibn Milhan. Haram ibn Milhan was the uncle of Anas ibn Malik. And he was so close to the Prophet والسلام, along with his sister, Umm Sulaim, and also Umm Haram ibn Milhan. She was also close to the Prophet ﷺ. And the stories say that they were related to the Prophet ﷺ through suckling and they were one of his mahrams. Haram ibn Milhan went to Amr ibn at tufayl 
to introduce Islam to him as he was the head and the leader of Bani Amr tribe. And I was, as he was introducing Islam to him, now remember he's a messenger. And messengers are killed. not to be killed by all means. And it, it, it's a global thing. Tradition. It's a tradition. You never kill the messenger. So Haram was introducing the message of Islam to Amr, this wicked leader. And without him noticing, Amr hinted to one of his soldiers to kill Haram. So the man, in a cowardly act, came from behind with a spear and he put it through his back until it went out from his chest. As he was introducing, now the reaction of Haram was astonishing. The minute he felt this blow, he took the blood and put it on his head and face, shouting, I have won by the grace of Allah, the Lord of the Kaaba. I have won. This was the first and last things, last thing he said. He did not think about the wife that he did not marry or the children that he did not trace. He did not think about the farm that he did not farm and harvest. He did not think about the buildings or the house he did not build. The only thing that jumped into his mind that I have won by the grace of Allah. Won what? You're being killed. You're, you're dead. This shows us that what was on the back of every single companion of the Prophet ﷺ was the definition of winning. If you are turned away from hell and succeeded in entering paradise, then you have won, as Allah tells us in the Holy Quran. And as soon as, as this messenger was killed, Amr sent to his people that come on, let's go and attack his companions who were camped outside of our tribe. They didn't know about what's going on. But his people rejected his call and objected. And how, did you, how do you dare do this when Amr ibn Malik gave them his protection? We will not move one single inch with you. So he turned to Bani, Bani Sulaim, another tribe, and he requested their support. And the, and, and, and the tribes of Ri'il, the Quan, and Usayyah, they all came with him. He, they sent their army, and they surrounded the 70 companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and they killed them all. They attacked them by surprise and killed them all, with the exception of Ka'b ibn Zayd, who was taken as, as dead, and, he, and they left him. They thought that he, he was dead, but he was not. There were two of the companions who were taking care of the camels and, and the rides that was with them. And they were uh, uh, Al-Mundhir ibn Uqba and Amr ibn Umayyah. As soon as they saw the birds flying, they knew that something wrong happened. So they went in and they saw their companions dead. Al-Mundhir could not hold himself back. He went and said, I will die on what my brothers and companions died on. And he fought them and, he, and they killed him. As for Amr ibn Umayyah, he was held capture as a prisoner. He was captured as a prisoner. He was brought to the leader of that tribe, the wicked leader Amr ibn Tufayl. And once he knew that he was from the tribe of Mudar. He said that I will let you go free because you are now a slave of mine and my mother has 
set a slave free and until now she did not buy a slave to set him free so I will consider you to be her slave and I will set you free but he chopped his hair from front and this was a sign that they did something wrong to him Amr al was set free and he left immediately to Medina and before he reached Medina Allah Azza wa revealed what happened to the companions to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam so he gathered his companions and he told them that your brothers met the polytheist, met the disbelievers and they've killed them all and they requested Allah that I would deliver the message to you that they, are, they have met their Lord, they've met Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. Look at this beautiful message, no revenge, no vengeance. All what you want to know is we are martyrs. Allah's, we've met Allah and He's pleased with us and we are also pleased with our Lord. Now Amr ibn Umayyah was on his way to Medina to inform the Prophet ﷺ of this treason so that they could retaliate and avenge the companions. On his way, he met two polytheists, two men, and he camped with them not telling them that he is a Muslim. He camped with them and until he saw them asleep, he killed them. And he took their goods and their luggage and went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. And he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about what took place in uh, Bi'r Ma'una and he told him about the two he killed. What he didn't know that these two had a treaty with the Prophet ﷺ a couple of days ago. And the Prophet told them that you are safe and sound. Nobody of our people would attack you. Amr did not know that. He just wanted to kill any disbelievers in front of him because of what they've done to his companions and to what they've done to him. So the Prophet ﷺ had to pay the blood money for the to the families of these two men that Amr killed. Now, the, the time, the financial uh, uh, situation in Medina at that time was not very prosperous. And the Muslims did not have enough money. So the treasury was empty. The Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ did not have any money to pay for these two uh, uh, that Amr killed. So he had to go to those who had money. And who would that be, you think? The Jews. The Jews. Mm -hmm. So he went to the Jews requesting their assistance because he had an agreement with the Jews that he would defend them. And they would defend the Muslims if anything would have happened. And if they needed to pay someone, they would assist and they would lend the Prophet ﷺ and he will pay them back so they had an agreement with them and to honor his word the Prophet ﷺ had to pay the blood money for those who were, killed. who were killed because he signed a treaty with so he went to the Jews to ask them to help him and that was in the third month which is Rabi'a al-Awwal of the fourth year he went there along with some of his companions, Abu Bakr, Umar, the close ones. And as he was met by the leaders of Banu and Nadir, they promised the Prophet ﷺ to help him, and they sounded very nice, in a sense, too nice. This was not the norm with, with the Jews. So they told him, okay, stay where you are, a Prophet of Allah, you're a guest, and we will bring you the money, the blood money you requested. You know, the banks are closed. Uh, we will get it from here and there, but uh, rest assured that we will bring it to you. So the Prophet ﷺ, with his friends, sat next to a house in the shade, waiting for them to bring the money. What the Prophet ﷺ did not know, that the leaders of the Jews gathered and in their meeting they said that 
this is your only chance to assassinate Muhammad so that you can get rid of him. One of them, Salam al Mishkam, who was a fierce enemy of Islam, told them, people, you know that he will be informed by Allah. You know that whatever you say, he, know, he knows it. And this shows you that they also knew that he was the messenger of Allah. And in some incidents, they used to say that we know that he's a messenger, but he's not a messenger to us. He's a messenger to the Arabs. And up to the moment, there are people that think this way. They believe in Prophet Muhammad Islam. They respect him. They believe he's a messenger, but they say he's not a messenger to all humankind. He's a messenger only to the Arabs. And by itself, this is a claim that is easy to reject because if you believe he's a messenger, then you believe that he's telling the truth. And in the Quran that he uh, uh, brought to us and in his sunnah, he tells us that you have to believe in him or you will be in hell. And he was sent to all mankind. And he also said about the previous prophets which they have in their own book. Of course. And all, all, all of this was said and stated in the Holy uh, uh, Quran and he taught us this. So they should and must believe in him. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. Until we meet next time. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.